Hi, I'm James. And I'm Anthony. And this is Words and Numbers. Brought to you by Khaki, the Center for American Culture and Ideas. So, Ant, what's new and exciting in your world this week? We received two letters from listeners about our discussion of potatoes and whether they're a grain or a vegetable from the previous episode. Your age is showing nobody received a letter. Well, emails. We received emails. <laughs> What's the last letter you received? Someone sent me a telegram about potatoes. <laughs> Miriam Fantastic. Gross writes, she says, I was listening to your recent episode about reclassification of the potato from a vegetable to a grain. I'm a registered dietitian and can lend a small amount of insight as to what's going on. The USDA, through the National School Lunch Program, requires school meals to contain a certain number of servings of various food groups, grains, vegetables, fruit, protein, and milk. School districts are a huge purchasing block for food manufacturers. So if the potato lobby can keep the potato classified as a vegetable, potatoes don't have to compete with the wheat lobby, the rice lobby, and the oats lobby. (laughs) Isn't that great? Yeah, but the potato lobby doesn't want to, and those other people don't want to. Everybody wants it to stay the same. Except the government. It's a vegetable. The government wants to reclassify as a grain. I think the beauty of this is that french fries and tater tots are vegetables. Yeah, but see, here's the thing. Potatoes in the form of french fries and tater tots are far more popular among kids than, for example, broccoli. So potato growers would rather compete with the vegetable lobbyists than with the grain lobbyists. Hence their desire to keep the potato as a vegetable. I don't blame them. I would want that too. Miriam goes on. She says, as a registered dietitian, it's my experience that the National School Lunch Program does a pretty awful job of serving kids nutritious meals. Agricultural lobbies have lots of pull in setting policy for school lunches, SNAP, WIC, and the Summer Meals Program. I know of a few school districts that actually do a good job of producing nutritious meals, but they source their food in great part from smaller local farms. Now, there's two fabulous lessons here. One, of course, is the regulatory capture. Anytime you have the government stepping in, telling people what they may and may not do, it's a siren call to corporations to send their lobbyists to have the law crafted to be in the corporation's best interests. And that's what you've got here at the root of this discussion of whether potato is a vegetable or a grain. But the second interesting lesson is subsidiarity. So she says here, and she says this doesn't happen often, but where it does happen that a school district locally sources its food from local farms, you get better nutrition, better lunches for the kids. That's subsidiarity governing at the lowest possible level. Now, you know, of course, the local farmers can lobby the school district to buy whatever it is the local farmers want to sell. But that kind of thing is not only much more visible to the local population, but the local population has greater ability to do something about it. Because why? You know the president of the school board. He lives down the street. You know the farmer, right? He's your neighbor over here. And so the individuals, the taxpayers, have much more clout when the government is acting at a low level than than at a high level. So that's one of the letters that we got. The other letter we got on this topic comes from my cousin, John Lamberson, who's a dietitian and diabetes educator. And John starts off by saying, I completely agree with free speech. (laughs) But I believe you and James need to leave nutrition education to the professionals, kind of like Pope Francis needs to leave economic discussion to economists. He says what just about everybody missed about the food pyramid was the need to pay attention to portion sizes. Starches, grains, cereals, breads make up the base of the pyramid. Six to eight servings was the general guideline for, quote, healthy Americans. But, he says, one serving is one slice of bread or half an English muffin or half a small bagel or half of a hamburger bun. It goes on and on. So, for example, if you have... For breakfast, a cup of oatmeal. For lunch, a turkey sandwich on whole wheat bread. For dinner, one cup of mashed potatoes. You've got six servings from the grain cereal group. 
And he says that's not enough to cause obesity. When you blame the rise in obesity on the changing food guidelines, you miss the reason why those changes were made. Obesity was rising as people began eating out more, demanding larger portions and exercising less. Now, this is a good rejoinder, but I think it inadvertently shines a light on the real problem, which is communication. The USDA committed the same error that for decades I've been complaining that economists routinely commit. The USDA took a commonly used word, serving, and attached a technical definition to it that's different from its common use definition. To any non-expert, a serving is a common portion. For example, you never eat half a hamburger bun, right? And rarely do you eat a single slice of bread. You know, you might have a piece of toast, but typically bread comes in two pieces, right? The top of the sandwich, the bottom of the sandwich. They come in pairs. So when a non-expert like me thinks about a serving of hamburger bun, I think of a hamburger bun, the top and the bottom halves together. But the USDA would tell us, no, no, that's two servings of grain. My claim here is the USDA would have been far more successful if it had adopted a different term entirely. For example, don't say servings of grain, say units of grain, or, or make up a new word entirely. But my beef here is more than just about the USDA's poor communication skills. Knowing people don't understand the USDA's technical usage of serving, companies can use that misunderstanding to mislead people. For example, do you recall years ago when you picked up a can of Coke, on the side is the nutrition label. This is when nutrition labels were first required. And it has, you know, how many grams of sugar per serving and all this stuff. I looked for it and I couldn't find it. But I could have sworn that in those early years, a can of Coke was two servings. Do you remember this? I remember it that way as well. And this could be a Mandela effect issue. It might never have been that way. But I absolutely remember it that way. I could have sworn that. And at the time, I was thinking, well, what's happening here is Coke is saying that the can of Coke, which any reasonable person would say is one serving, says it's two servings so that the sugar content looks less. No, oh, that's right. And this happens all the time with especially snack foods, right? So you'll, you'll reach into the container of Pop-Tarts, and everybody knows that there are two Pop-Tarts per tin foil container. Yeah. But you know that the serving size is one Pop-Tart. It's one Pop-Tart, right, yeah. Who eats one of them? Which is absolute nonsense, right? If you take two out, packaged together, trust me, that's the <laughs> That's right, size. yeah. Now, the FDA has taken steps to rein in food companies on this, but I suspect that they've substituted one problem for another. Serving sizes listed on nutrition facts labels, according to FDA regulation now, are no longer recommended serving sizes, that is recommended by, I guess, the manufacturer, but rather serving sizes that people actually consume. So the FDA has cracked down on this. And this is where I couldn't find an example because I looked up examples of nutrition labels on cans of Coke and all the ones I could find said one serving. So apparently, you know, the FDA has cracked down on this. But what this does is it exacerbates this dual definition of serving problem. Whereas before the USDA meant one thing by serving and people meant something else, now the nutrition fact label has to follow people's definitions of serving, while the USDA continues to use its own and smaller definition of serving. This is why I ignore almost everything. Yeah, at the end of the day, the FDA is giving us all of these recommendations, which my cousin John will say, I would presume, are good recommendations, but they're not communicating them well because they've redefined a word to mean something other than what the rest of us use it to mean. I can tell you that as a diabetic, I have to ignore all that. Yeah, I imagine so. Right? Yeah. When it comes to serving sizes, it's all irrelevant. The only thing to me that matters is the carb content. And, you know, I got to keep that daily intake of carbohydrates very, very low, so low that it's almost impossible to accomplish. I look around and I wonder how many other people should be doing that but aren't because it's a pain. Yeah. And we're debating whether a potato is a vegetable or a grain. <laughs> All I can think of when I think of school lunches is that every school lunch I ever had came out of a bag or a can and it was disgusting. Then came Michelle Obama, remember? And she wanted to make school lunches really healthy. Ketchup was a vegetable then. Even, 
She made no, that was Reagan. Michelle Obama made school lunches even less enticing than they once were. But it's regulatory capture. That's the issue. The minute the government does something, certain industries seize upon it to make more money. And that's the weird thing for me, because people who push back against free market economists have in their minds that they can pass these laws and all these wonderful things will happen. And free market economists look at that and all they see is is a string of endless regulatory capture. You're just handing power to corporations. And the very people who bemoan the power corporations wield want to give more power to government, which in turn gives more power to corporations. Yes. I've got something a little more lighthearted. We don't often talk about stand-up comedy, but I want to talk about Dave Chappelle for a minute, who I think is an absolute hoot. If you're out there, Dave Chappelle, give us a call. We'd love to have you on. Well, he might not give us a call after I tell the story of what he pulled down in, in Miami a couple of nights ago. He went on stage and did, I guess he was about halfway through his act, and he became incensed that somebody in the crowd was on his cell phone and he uh, just stormed off stage and didn't come back. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, you know, the people in the room had paid $100 each for the privilege. Yeah. Do they get their money back? I mean, what the hell? Well, why walk off? Now, I mean, I, kick the guy out. Don't punish everybody in the well, room. I mean, I look, as an avid concert goer, I, too, am often irritated with people on cell phones. I don't like them. I think that when you're out at a show, you should put your phone away. But I don't know what the right answer is, right? And that's the thing. Some venues take your phones away and they put them in these little bags that it's, I guess it's like a, a Faraday bag. Oh, right. It won't let a signal in. And you get to keep the bag, right? You keep your phone in your hand, but you can't take it out of the bag for the, the show. And if you want to use it, you got to leave the venue, use it, and then go back in. That seems like a thoroughgoing pain in the ass to me, but I get it, I guess. When I go to, to Marillion Weekend, at uh, the beginning of each show, a gentleman comes on stage and shames everyone in the audience and tells them that they are to put their phones away and they are to not take them out. Maybe take them out and take a single picture or two and then put them back. But nobody wants to be looking through your phone at the stage. Right. And certainly nobody wants to hear you talking on your phone during the show. But... You know, we've gotten to a point where it's baffling to me that you have to remind people of this. You know, I see it at airports all the time. I remember the good old days when if you wanted to take a call in an airport, you walked to a far corner where you could be alone and not bother anybody. Yep. Now people just take the calls wherever they are. And it irritates me so much, Aunt that I involve myself in the conversations. <laughs> I, will, I do. I butt right into the conversations. <laughs> I opine that, yes, Laura should be fired for what she did last week, or that we should move the deadline for the project up a week. It is Christmas after all. And people become befuddled at this behavior, but they're never befuddled by their own behavior of intruding into my private space with their phone calls. As bad as you experience it here, and I have experienced as well what you're describing, in Spain, it's way worse. At least here, people have the tendency, you, yes, you'll talk in public, but very few people are talking at the top of their voices. In Spain, it seems to be the thing, uh, particularly amongst young people, to just be yelling. In fact, they won't even hold the phone up to their ear. They hold it out in front of them. <laughs> and they've got the volume up, so you're hearing both ends of the conversation. Yeah. It just seems to be culturally accepted. I don't know. I think that's right. And I think I'm going to have to adjust and those people won't. But when you get to the Dave Chappelle show, Dave decided he wasn't going to adjust. He was going to leave. And frankly, I don't blame him. I wonder what happens what there. Do you tell like, a, what do you tell all those people who paid 100 bucks to go see Dave? Do they get half their money back? Right. Do they get all of their money back? I, I'm guessing they don't get any of their money back. Oh, I'm guessing there's at least one lawyer in that crowd who's thinking about a lawsuit. Yeah, probably. Anyway, that brings us to the foolishness of the week. And I'll tell you, Aunt, we have a brand new candidate, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. I think we've mentioned well, her before. No, I don't think we have. Well, I'll leave it to Andre Mount to set us <laughs> both straight on that count. But she wrote an op-ed back on December 21st titled, Bidenomics is working for the middle class. And she contended therein that, quote, 
Wages have risen more than prices since 2019. This is where you should be a political scientist and not an economist, because she said Bidenomics is working for the middle class, but Joe Biden wasn't president in 2019 or 2020. Right, yeah. Is she saying that Trumponomics was good for the middle class? I don't think she would want to say that, but she's certainly not really talking about President Biden's time in office. And this is what politicians do. They just start monkeying about with categories. Mm -hmm comparing this to that thing, inapt comparisons. And here they're just taking two years that had nothing to do with Joe Biden and using that to prove that Bidenomics is working. If I recall, we didn't get that heavy inflation until after Trump was out of office. Now, I think a lot of it had to do with things he did while he was in office. Yeah, I don't know what these clowns are trying to claim here. I really don't. First off, presidents don't really have that much influence over an economy anyway. But then to claim that everything Joe Biden has done has made life better for the working class is absolutely absurd. Well, I wouldn't say it's not better, but if it is better, it's just the standard growth better. It has nothing to do with him one way or the other. It's not better than before he took office. We've had, what, roughly 8% inflation year over year since he took office. We're down now to about three. We had about a year at eight and then another year at about seven. Now we're down to about three. So we're not better off unless wages increase past inflation, which they haven't, or we get falling prices, which we haven't. Now you're going to make me look it up. Real house... Type, Ant. Type. Real dance, monkey, household dance. income. <laughs> All right. Here are the facts from... The cold, hard From facts. Janet Yellen's previous employer, not just her previous employer, but she was running the shop, the Federal Reserve. So it must be right. The Federal Reserve. This is real median household income in the United States. So this is the guy in the middle. It's adjusted for inflation. And it is almost straight line downward since 2019. Ain't that a kick in the pants? 78,000 in 2019. 74, almost 75,000 today. So that's 74. That's, five, that's, that's two, the, that is the product of the inflation yeah, of the period. We are down, the median household is down 6% in purchasing power since 2019. Because nominal wages are surely up. Yeah. So net of whatever nominal wages are doing minus whatever inflation is doing. Minus inflation. Yeah. The median household's down 6%. And I, I'm looking at this year over year. So 2019 to 2020 is down. 2020 to 2021 is also down, but not by that much. But then 21 to 22 is down remarkably. That's when Biden became president. Yeah. Now, this is, yeah. this is annual data, so I don't, and it's stopping at 2022. So I don't know what's happening after that. All right. But we have a very obvious conclusion, and it is, as expected, f*** off Janet Yellen. <laughs> <laughs> for one-stop shopping for all things James and Ant, visit our website, wordsandnumbers.org. We give a special shout-out to our Patreon sponsors who help us keep the lights on. If you'd like to contribute, go to patreon.com slash wordsandnumbers. I don't know how these things work, right? The episodes that we record, they go into a big pile and then they come out at some indeterminate time. People will say, hey, I loved Words and Numbers this week. And I'll say, what was it about? And they always look at me like I've got four heads <laughs> of all the people in the world who should know what it was about. I'm kind of at the top of that list, but I never know. So at some point in the not too distant past, we said we were going to talk about the time value of money. Right. And a bunch of non-economists went, oh, come on, talk about something interesting. So there's your challenge, Ant, because I don't have much to say about the time value of money. So you're going to have to find a way to make this interesting. Well, I'll give it a shot. Let me stop you there before you've even started. Can you make it interesting in a way that would include people who are not graduate students in economics? Yeah, I think so. This is something that is at the core of what we deal with anytime we're dealing with loans, anytime we're thinking about what economists technically call intertemporal choices, which boils are, down are simply. You kidding, killing me, man. 
You're killing me. Boils down simply to do I want something now or am I willing to wait, save up my money and have something better in the future? That's an intertemporal choice. You know, in my other life, I am the editor at the American Institute for Economic Research, as the good people might know. And I published an article, or I'm going to publish an article, I believe, on Christmas Day. So future tense for us, past tense for the people listening, about Christmas trees. It was written by a guy, Trey Carson, Byron Carson the Third goes by Trey. And he wanted to talk about Christmas tree farms and Christmas tree sales. Yeah. And this, I would submit, is the perfect time value of money example. Because the people who grow the trees know that they can get a lot more money for a big tree than they can for a small tree. But they can cut all the trees and get money right now instead of getting money in the future. Yeah. Or they could just sell the land and go to Tahiti or something. This is time value of money right down to the core. It really is. The Christmas trees are a good example. When I teach it, I talk about college students. I said, look, you're doing this right now. Why are you sitting here at 8 a.m. studying economics when you could be on a beach in Tahiti? And they all kind of laugh. And I said, no, you really could be on a beach in Tahiti. And they say, well, I can't afford it. I said, hang on. How much are you paying to be here right now? <laughs> they start to see that what it is is a trade-off. They're willing to forego Tahiti now in exchange for four years of drudgery, after which they earn enough that they could go to Tahiti plus buy other things. I once had a discussion with a student who was not being particularly productive in my class. And I said, why are you even here? Hmm. And he said, so I can get a good job. And I said, why do you want to get a good job? And he said, so I could buy stuff. And I said, what kind of stuff? And he said, I want to buy a house. And I said, okay, we live in Syracuse, New York. At the time, the average house in Syracuse, New York was about $150,000. The cost of his education, about $150,000. <laughs> right. right. I said, look, I've just saved you and more importantly, me, a lot of trouble. Drop out of school, take that money and buy a house. Yeah. And did he? <laughs> no, he kept right on bothering me in my class for the rest of the year. But, you know, if I had pushed him further... He would have said, well, I want other things too. And that's always the kicker, right? Nobody wants one thing. They want all kinds of things. They want what we called recently the good life. Yeah. We called it that. But Plato called it that too, right? Aristotle had a word to say on the matter. It's nothing new to us. But this is all the time value of money, right? You make your bets and you watch how it plays out. And this is one of the things I think that people tend to misunderstand about interest if you push them on, well, why does interest exist at all? They'll talk about inflation and they'll say, and this is correct. They'll say the guy that loans you $100 today, you pay him back $100 a year from now. And because of inflation, that $100 won't buy as much. So you give him extra to overcome the cost of the inflation. And that's part of what interest does, but it's not the whole thing. The other part of what interest does is it compensates that guy for going for 365 days without his $100 because he loaned it to you. And this hits directly at the heart of this business that people repeat, and I don't know why, saying that landlords are just greedy, they charge you rent, and they just you know make all this money and they're not doing anything. And you know, first off, the landlord is doing things. He's managing the properties, he's fixing stuff, all of that. But even if he didn't, even if you picture a hypothetical landlord that just built this building, it's new and doesn't require any maintenance or anything at all, and all he does is he sits in his chair watching Netflix all day long collecting rent checks. And you look at that and you say, well, that's not right. I'm paying him this money. Yes, he should be reimbursed for the cost of the building, but over time, we're paying him much more than the cost of the building. We're paying him extra. Yeah, that extra you're paying hits at this time value of money. Because if this guy, let's say, owns the building for 20 years, and let's say the building cost, pick a round number, a million dollars to build, that's 20 years that his million dollars is tied up. He doesn't get to go spend it on cars or going out to dinner or going to Tahiti or something else. It's tied up in that building. Now, 
20 years from now, he sells the building, he gets the million dollars back. But that's 20 years in the future. He needs to be compensated for the fact that he's got to wait 20 years to enjoy this money. That's the time value of money. It's a lot more complicated than that, too, because in all likelihood, he was paying a mortgage that whole time. Oh, yeah. You want to get serious on this. He's paying a mortgage, which is charging him interest. Why? Because the bank has a time value of money. And why does the bank have a time value of money? Because it has to pay its depositors, the people who put their money in there, and they have a time value of money. They want to be paid extra for putting off consumption. So yes, bank, you can have my money now. I'll come back in five years, but I want a bonus because of that. That's the time value of money. It turns out the time value of money is wrapped into every single economic decision that we make. There was Gary Becker, an economist. He won the Nobel Prize in part for some work that he did on choices like this that people make. He wrote a paper asking the question, what is the optimal age to get married? And he built this whole mathematical model thing, and I forget what the answer he came to is, but the answer didn't matter. What was interesting was the thought process. And he said, look, you're out there, and if you get married early, it's possible that you miss some opportunities. Maybe there's somebody better out there that you missed because you got married too soon. But if you get married too late, now what happens? You've got less time to enjoy being married to this person, whoever it is. And so he says there's this optimal time to get married. No sooner, no later. That's time value of money as well, only it's not the enjoyment from money, it's the enjoyment from being married. I'm thinking of all kinds of things, if I could have anything right now, I'm kind of a low rent guy. You all, you all know this. I really want a PS5. Can't wait. Mm. Can't wait. But if I don't buy a PS5, that's money that I can apply to all kinds of other things later. Yeah. And if I don't buy the PS5, and they're expensive, not so expensive I couldn't afford it, but expensive enough for me to think twice about it. Because what would I do with that money otherwise? Well, I might pay off some high interest bills. Mm -hmm. I might invest it, right? However I cut it, there's going to be more money later than there is now if I don't buy this thing. Right. And when it comes to electronics like the PS5, it becomes even more interesting because the price tag on electronics drops dramatically, very quickly. And so you can say, well, I'd rather have the PS5 now than a year from now. But if I wait a year, it'll be 30% cheaper. And so now you do this balancing of, is the 30% cheaper worth waiting a year to play with the thing? And if I wait a year, it might be a PS6. Right. And if I really want a new video game system today, I could get a PS4. Yeah. And these are all time value of money consideration. And they all feed directly into figuring out what the interest rate is. So when we talk about, you know, the fat cats on Wall Street making all this money and they don't do anything, they do tremendous good for the economy. What they're doing is moving financial instruments around so that people can take advantage of interest rates so they can make their intertemporal choices well, so that when you decide, I don't want to wait 30 years to buy a house, I want to buy one now, and I'm willing to pay extra in the form of interest to have the house now rather than later, who in the back end makes all of that happen? It's the banks, it's the financial institutions, ultimately it goes all the way to the guys on Wall Street who are moving money back and forth in light of people's time preference for money to make that money available to you when you need it. What you're really talking about is an allocation problem. Yeah, yeah. That's the term we use. Mm -hmm. How much am I going to use for this or that? Right. But how am I going to allocate it given the realities of today? I have a 2.8% mortgage. I was fortunate enough to refinance as interest rates just went into a downward spiral. That impacts every financial decision I now make. If I took out a mortgage right now and it was pushing 8%, it would behoove me to pay extra on that mortgage and bring the principal down. At 2.8%, it's absolutely foolish to do that. You would rather have the money now than later at 
Actually, if the bank said, would you like to take out another mortgage at 2.8%, I would say, yes, yes, I do. Yes, please. Yeah. That would be quite wonderful. Turn around, put it in a CD for 5%. Or something of that sort. Yeah. I found just a standard savings account the other day for 4.3. Good God. 4.3. It was just like, what, two years ago that savings was a quarter of a percent? Yeah, 0.2, 0.3. Interest compensates you for two things. One is the time value of money. The other is inflation. And the 4% interest you're seeing now, that's compensating you largely for the inflation. Here's a thing that people say that, well, I pay interest on a loan and that money just goes to the bank. And that's greedy banks taking interest. Why should they take interest if I'm going to pay them back everything I borrowed? I borrow $100,000, I pay them back $100,000. Why do they need interest? Because the bank is not your mother. Well, but here's the thing. We'll take your mortgage as an example. You borrowed, you know, let's say $300,000 for a house. That money comes from somewhere. And people say, well, it comes from the bank. No, it doesn't come from the bank. It comes from other people, people like me. I put money into my retirement fund. Because I'm willing to not spend the money now in exchange for spending it 30 years from now when I retire. So I put it in the bank and on the understanding the bank's going to pay me interest on that. What does the bank do? It turns around, loans it to you and charges you interest. Where's that interest going that you pay? It's not going to the bank. It's going to me. <laughs> because why? I gave up spending this money today in exchange for spending it decades in the future, provided I get a little bit more. You in turn said, I want to spend the money on the house now, not decades in the future, in exchange for paying a little bit more in interest. So if it's the case, and I think it clearly is, that time considerations underlie all of our economic determinations, why is it that people just don't understand this? Why is this so difficult for people to get their head around? I think in some way they overthink it because people on a day-to-day -day basis make these decisions all the time. Anytime you choose, you know, I'm going to clean the kitchen now instead of sitting down and having lunch because I really want to get this kitchen clean, right? That's time. That's a time preference thing, time value. You say, look, I'm going to put off having lunch in exchange for getting this thing done. So we make these decisions all the time. But when it comes somehow to things like mortgages and rent and banks and Wall Street, we imagine that there's this huge pool of money out there and these rich fat cats are going to dribble it to us in little bits and pieces. We miss the point. We've overthought it. All of that that's going on is simply businesses, banks, institutions facilitating us making at its root the same sorts of decisions as should I clean the kitchen now, have lunch later, or have lunch now and clean the kitchen later. And really, if you drill into this deeply enough, what you find is that these are the quintessential economic questions and they're always about trade-offs. Always about trade-offs. You can't have everything. And this is where it just irks me to no end, the political climate we live in, because politicians want you to think that you can indeed have everything, that there are no trade-offs. You can, Ant, if you just vote for them. <laughs> right. Just vote for them and there won't be trade-offs. And what's happening, I tell you, there are trade-offs. They're just lying to you. They're hoping you don't notice the trade-offs. It turns out that the politicians have time preferences for money, too. And it's the future. That's why we have a $33 trillion debt. That's right. Politicians can do something that the rest of us can't. You know, I can go and run up my credit cards and have a great time, but it's going to come back to bite me because eventually credit card companies are going to want their money back. Politicians, on the other hand, they can run up the national debt and then they can retire and let the next politician deal with the problem. Who curiously behaves in exactly the Who same way. Who behaves in the same way, right, exactly. So I have nothing else interesting to say about the time value of money other than all it is is the same thing, that we're making choices all the time. And time value of money comes in when those choices are not two things in front of me right now, but one thing in front of me now and something else that's going to be in front of me in the future. But it's the same thing. We make choices. Or that you hope will be in front of you. Or I future. hope will be in front of me, yeah. And that's always the thing, right? Because every time I put something off, the last lingering thought I have is, 
Of course, we could all die before that happens. Well, but I think that's the thing. That's part of why there is a time value of money, because something can happen to you in the future. You know, for example, I've always wanted a sports car, and I could buy one now, or I could wait in after I save the money and buy one later. What's the problem with buying one later? Well, later, I might not be as able to enjoy driving the sports car as I am now. Maybe my eyesight is worse or whatever. It's hard to get in or out of the thing. I don't know what, but there are all sorts of things that can happen between now and the future that would cause me to enjoy this thing I'm thinking about less. And so my tendency is to want it now rather than later. And there are exceptions. If you've just eaten a big meal, you don't want more food now. But that's temporary, and it tends to be the exception rather than the rule. Oh, and here's the thing. Even insanely rich people face these choices. You know, think about Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos or whoever your favorite evil multi-billionaire. You can say, well, they've got so much money, they don't face choices like this. And yet they do. Their constraint isn't money, it's time. Yeah, although they could buy anything they want, they can't enjoy it all simultaneously, right? If you want to go out on your yacht, you can't be flying your plane. If you want to fly your plane, you can't be going out on your yacht. And again, you have to make a choice. I would be a little more grim about it. I would say, look, they all know they're going to die too. Yeah, that's right. And that plays here. That is a relevant concern when you're looking at the time value of money. Because at some point, time ends for you. Yes. And it ends for all of us, as of this moment anyway. And that's all the time we've got this week on Words and Numbers. Until next time, be sure to follow us on Twitter. Handles are in the show notes. Join Words and Numbers Backstage, the Facebook group where the conversation continues, and... Send us email, wordsandnumberspodcast at gmail.com. Until next week, try to be nice to one person. One person who doesn't deserve it. Just one. And who knows? It may turn into a trend. Give it a shot. You might feel good about yourself. You could say you tried. You tried. That's right. Till next week. Can't take it easy. See you next week, James. 